really joyful time of reflection on the word of God and song and praise. Thank you for that. Those of you with our, as our musicians and leaders are grateful for that. My beloved, you know, I am his and he is mine. Isn't that wonderful? If you've read any of the Gospels and you read the words of Jesus Christ, you know the same conclusion, the men who heard him actually speak in his day, that never, never has there been a man who spoke like Christ. He would speak to people in a way that Nobody had really heard that before. It was Bible. It was scripture, but it was different. He spoke to their hearts. He spoke with authority. A lot of what he taught was to clean up not just the behavior, but the heart motivation that people had in the practice of their religion. Israel was a religious nation. It's not a secular nation. It was filled with religious people. But what motivated them in their religion? Motivation to Christ was everything. Why you came to worship God, what you expected to get out of what you did in religion, that mattered to Christ. He taught in the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon ever, that there were religious leaders that would pray in public and fast in public and do this and do that in order to be seen by men, right? And he said, okay, paraphrase, you wanted to be seen by men. <laughs> you were seen by men and you got your reward then in full. Whatever congratulations that people gave to you, that's all you're gonna get because God, he's not gonna give you any reward. You wanted men's approval, you got it. But what you ought to be doing in your heart, motivation, is you ought to be seeking to please God, right? Motivation matters. In John 4, he told the woman by the well, God desires people who will worship him in spirit and truth. These are the kinds of worshipers God seeks to have. Not the phony, not those who invent their own words, but those who are genuine and listen to the word of God and worship him that way. That's what God seeks. Paul reflected on being genuinely motivated in his uh, second letter to the Corinthians. He spends really the whole book almost explaining his heart to the Corinthians who had so falsely judged him and helping them to understand his inner motivation. He said, we have as our ambition, whether at home, that is in heaven, or, or I'm sorry, in the body at home, or absent, that is up in heaven, to be pleasing to God. He wanted to be pleasing to God. When he wrote the Galatians in the first chapter, he said, am I now pleasing men? If I were pleasing men, I would not be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. I'm suffering for this, guys. I, I seek to please God. That's what I'm trying to do here. So with some of those great examples in Scripture, I would just ask you today, why? Why are you following Jesus Christ? Why are you choosing to be here in church? What are you hoping to get out of religion? What is it that motivates you in your heart? What are you doing here? What's on the inside in your conscience that only you and God can hear and know? Well, today, just in one tiny verse, we're going to see James, the author of this great epistle, focus us on core motivation, what we hope to get out of it all. Where does all of this lead? What should be in our heart right now? It's James chapter one. I'm sure most of you turn there. If you haven't, please go ahead and open your Bibles there. James chapter one. James follows the book of Hebrews. So we're still in chapter one. We're only verse 12, and that's as far as we'll get today. One verse. Blessed is a man, James writes there. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. 
I find this verse to be a fitting conclusion to James's opening topic dealing with trials. I would put it in verses 2 through 11 and not with the verses that follow. Different people break it at different places, but I think it goes much better with verses 2 through 11. Please notice that the, uh, the words and the themes in this one verse connect backwards. There is the term trial that is repeated and, and used uh, earlier. There is the theme of perseverance or endurance, which is also accentuated. There's the idea of testing and even blessedness in the midst of trials that he repeats. Verse 12 also continues the theme of eschatological reversal that we saw in verses 9 through 11. That is, that in the end, as you look at life all the way to the end, the rich and the poor, well, that's not going to matter today. It's all going to be the same. The poor Christian will be given a great inheritance in the kingdom and have that forever. The rich brother should realize that he's fading away in this life. Everything is equal. And so when you come to verse 12, it's kind of like been building through the section, and this is a climax, a punctuation mark, if you would. What follows in verses 13 through 16 is really a new topic. It's the topic of temptations. Unlike trials, temptations are not something to be endured. They are something to be resisted and run from. Why? Because temptations don't build us up. They are a solicitation to do evil, and evil tears us down. Trials are thoughtful difficulties God the Father brings into our life to clean us up and to strengthen us and make us better believers, to mature us. There is a world of difference between those two thoughts, temptation to drag you down and destroy you, or a trial to build you up, make your faith stronger, and bring a greater blessing to you. Now James kind of puts the capstone on that teaching on trials by teaching us there's only one way today to live which will lead to blessedness in the future. And that is right now we should be out of our love for God seeking to please him. Seeking a reward from him, not from men. Be pleasing in God's sight. That's the right motive. What would be the wrong motive? To live for yourself. Everywhere you turn... In society, it tells you, usually to make money off of you, live for yourself, you deserve it, right? Isn't that the message you're getting everywhere? Commercials, friends, even in false religion. It's all about you, how your life can be this and how God can be your servant and make it better this way. It's all about you. That's false religion. True religion is what it's about God. What glorifies God? What does he like to hear? What, what is pleasing to him? If you live for yourself, you live for your own pleasure, right? You make the decisions and line up your life and your money and everything so that you can get your life arranged so it'll be just that little oasis that you want for yourself and poo-paw on the rest of the world, right? It's just about you. It's about your empire. It's about your fun. If your family doesn't fulfill that, then forget the family. You'll go find someone else. If, if the job doesn't fulfill that, forget them. Who needs to be loyal to them? You'll move on. It's self-motivation, right? People want to become liked. They want to become the coolest person. They want to fit in. They wear the right clothes in order to do that. They drive the right car in order to do that. They associate with certain people and disassociate with others in order to achieve themselves, some, some achievement for themselves, I mean. And they turn their back to God. They don't really want to please him. They just throw a little religion in because that also looks good to some men. Well, I think this lesson is important, and I think this verse really impresses on us you know, two overall realities about seeking reward from God. First of all, we need to know who it is that God actually rewards. Who is it that God blesses? So that's the first point. We need to know who God blesses. And, and by knowing who God blesses, say to ourselves, that's, that's the guy I want to be. I want to be the one whom God blesses. And then the second part here, it neatly divides into two parts, is to know what way God blesses us. See, because uh, we may want certain blessings now, but we need to understand how God blesses. Who does God bless, and how does he bless them? Those are our, that's our outline, and that's our focus from this verse. Look at verse 12 again. We start with who it is that God blesses. Bless, blessed is a man. So first of all, we know God never blesses ladies, right? Blessed is a man. I knew that all along. Of course not. That's a male term, but it means and stands for the human race. Blessed is the person, a man, who perseveres under trial. There it is. You want to seek God's favor, his reward, his blessing, then the kind of person God blesses is the one who perseveres, endures under trial. Bummer, huh? You wish there was another message. 
Yeah, it, it would be nice if it's like, blessed is a man who, and then you could fill in what it is that you would like to pursue, right? Ain't that way. False Christianity says that's what God says. You hear that enough on TV. That's false Christianity. It uses all the same terminology, but makes God the servant of your cause rather than you the servant of his cause. That's really how you can divide it. Are you living for God or living for yourself? Does God serve you or do you serve God? What is it? So, I want to be a blessed man. I hope you want to be a blessed person, someone blessed by God. Let's describe exactly who this person is. The idea of a blessed man was not something new to the Jews. Jews had this in their Hebrew scriptures and they understood that God gave blessings upon a certain kind of a man and he did not bless other kind of people. James is a Jew. He's writing to Jewish Christians here very early in the history of the church, so they're very familiar with this concept. He doesn't even have to introduce it. He just says, blessed is the man. Let's just uh, reflect on a very small portion of the Hebrew Scriptures that would repeat this kind of a thing. Very first one of all the Psalms, the first verse, Psalm 1-1 says, and there it is, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. There's a lot of counsel in the wicked. Blessed is the man that ignores that. And then it goes dot, 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 but his delight is in the law of God. There it is. How do we be blessed? My delight, inner core motivation, is in the law of God, not listening to the counsel of wicked people. God will bless that. Psalm 32, verses 1 and following, has a number of blessings there. It says, how blessed is he who's transgression or sin is forgiven that's a blessing whose sin is covered we all sin how blessed is the one whose sin is covered by who by God right Psalm 40 and verse 4 another example how blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust have you made the Lord God your trust and has not turned to the proud people nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Don't turn to those. Put your trust in God. The proud boast about what they're able to do for you. Don't put your trust in them is the point. Psalm 106.3, how blessed are those who keep justice, who practice righteousness all the time. So wonderful to have a leader who always wants to do the righteous and just thing, right? Who looks out for the unborn or looks out for the orphan or the widow or whatever to really do the right thing. What about this one, Psalm 112, 1? How blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Proverbs 3, 13, how blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. All these are blessings from God. You got the idea, right? Blessedness is related to obedience, to godly living, to wisdom. You ask God for wisdom, God gives it, then you learn from that wisdom, you walk in the pathway God wants you to walk in. As you're walking in that pathway, its end leads to blessing. You could picture the pathway now, it's got its twists and turns, but that is the pathway on which leads to blessing. Jesus even picked up on this theme when he talked about the two gates, remember? The end of the Sermon on the Mount, he's really talking about how do you enter the kingdom of heaven. He said, well, there's a very small gate and a narrow way, and that's the one that leads to life. You've got to be humble to go through that gate. You're going to not follow very many people, because most people are going to say they don't want to go. And then there's a very wide, probably a beautiful gate. Lots of people look at it. They say, this is the way to go. They look at one another. They say, well, that's the way everyone else is going, and they follow that way. And Jesus said that way leads to destruction. So there's only two ways, life, destruction, that's it. So there's a way that is right and leads to blessing. Now, we haven't even learned what the blessing is. Whatever the blessedness is, this is supposed to be something good. People are supposed to hear that in the Bible and say, I want to be blessed. Put the blessing on me. Don't forget me. I want to be blessed. It's a, it's a good it's a good thing. Now, when the Bible says someone is blessed, please understand, it's not talking about a wish in the wind. I kind of hope this will happen, but it has no substance to it, you know? A, a blessing from God is a rock-solid pronouncement of fact. Blessed is the man who. Whoever does this is blessed, guaranteed. That's what it is. In fact, a blessing, if you were to think about what's the opposite of a blessing, it would have to be something where they're pronounced and there's some kind of something really bad that's going to happen to them. One word that is used in the Bible that's the opposite of that is the word woe. Woe. Not like, you know, you pull the horse back and say, don't run anymore, you're scaring me. But woe as in eternal condemnation awaits you. Isaiah really picks up on this. I'll just give you a sampling of that. Isaiah 3.11. Woe to the wicked. 
That'd make a great church sign. I'm still waiting for a great church sign one day. Just put it out there rather than, you know, Jesus likes you and so do I. All this stuff out there drives me nuts. Just woe to the wicked. That would save more people, I think. And then the next one would be a nice subscript. It will go badly with him. <laughs> Bible's blunt. For what he deserves will be done to him. Man. Isaiah 5, 11. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may pursue strong drink. Who stay up late in the evening that wine may inflame them. Yeah, what were you doing last night? Mm -hmm. Isaiah 10, 1. Woe to those who enact evil statutes. Listen up, Congress. And to those who constantly record unjust decisions. Listen in, Supreme Court. Isaiah 29, 15, woe to those who deeply hide their plans from the Lord and whose deeds are done in a dark place and they say, who sees us? Man, that sounds like today, doesn't it? So getting God's blessing rather than God's woe, that's a great thing. Blessed translates the Greek adjective makairos, sometimes various versions translated as happy, rather weak translation, I think. Blessedness certainly involves happiness, but the word is much richer. Feelings come and go. Bauer in his Greek-English lexicon gives it this sense. One who is blessed is a, quote, privileged recipient of divine favor. In other words, it goes way beyond happiness to good fortune, to a safe, stable, joyous position, to a bright and glorious outcome. People who are blessed should be congratulated because it's a very desirable condition to be in. It's something that has joy and the joy just keeps bubbling. They're blessed. So please don't base your understanding of blessedness on mere feelings or present circumstances. Oh, wow, he won the lottery. He's blessed. No, it's much more than that. And I want to linger on this thought just a little bit because I've I found that this is one of those religious terms and people come in and are like blessed and I don't know what goes through, but they don't really, it, particularly the young people, it's like, why do I want to be blessed? That doesn't sound exciting. And who really wants to be blessed? I want to... I want to do something meaningful in life. I want to go places and meet people and do fun things. And so let me put it to you in some slightly different words. Someone who is blessed is someone who wins and doesn't lose and gets to have all the spoils of the victor, all the riches and the fame and the glory and the privilege and the joy that comes with that is blessed. Victory. Yes, that's what it is. Winning during this life you know, those that, you know, I'm richer than you, I got more, look nicer than you, I got a nicer job than you. And they say it in so many ways, ha ha. Winning in this life, come on, it's not that impressive. It's really not that impressive. It doesn't even achieve for them lasting happiness. They're all sad because they're having to brag to try to get more happiness by bragging about what they think brings them happiness, and it obviously doesn't, or they wouldn't be bragging. When I hear people bragging how well they're doing now, that's like bragging when your team is winning at halftime. <laughs> Don't join the world in their halftime celebrations. When the trumpet sounds, as Scripture says, and the end comes near, when the end of your life draws near or Christ is about to come, they will lose miserably. Woe to them. You, believer in Jesus, will win. The blessing here refers to the favor of God and the favors of God and the bliss that is promised to be coming. No, no one knows how to make us happy, blessed, joyful. No one knows better how to do that than God. That's why Satan is always maligning God as if he's out of touch with our lives. You have to trust God, not the devil. Of course, the blessings start now spiritually. They're here. But there's even more that's to be realized in the life to come. D. Edmund Hebert writes this. He says, blessedness points to a state of the soul that the believer begins to experience in his life now, even amid adverse outward circumstances, but its full bliss will be realized only 
in the future life. Whatever Christianity has brought you now, it's nothing compared to what it will bring to you in the future. Blessedness is actually what everybody in the world wants. They seek it. They want to be blessed. They just don't know that they're wanting to be blessed. And they're looking for blessing in all the wrong places. They're looking for blessing from the world. They're looking for blessing from sinning, by being proud, by pursuing things. They're trying to get out of that their own blessing, and it fails them and fails them. It's money and sex and toys and games and me, me, me. And they're seeking the blessing and they never really get it. If they listen to Christ, what did he say? The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that your life would be miserable, right? I came so that your life would be what? Full of abundance, right? You would have abundant life. He knows better. That's what he wants, to give us abundance. God wants us to be joyful. He wants to give us glory and blessing. Now, how does one actually become that blessed person? Well, now we're back to what follows. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. The blessing which is mostly in the future comes because of something that we do now in the present. Now we persevere. Now we endure, and we endure under trial. Yes, that sounds very similar to verses 2 through 4 where we were told, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the trials produce endurance, endurance brings about that completion of character and maturity that we long for. It is not a blessing that is pronounced for those who try to escape their trials. It is not a blessing that is pronounced on those who successfully dodge their trials. Aw, rats. It is a blessing for the one who walks through the fire and gets cleansed. Blessing for him or her. Let me take it a step further. It is not a blessing that merely goes to those who have trials and then they go through the trial. Everybody has trials. Unbelievers have trials. Unbelievers have things that are hurtful that happen to them, right? It's not just anybody who suffers that has this blessing. That's not what he's saying. It is the one who has faith in Jesus Christ and then he endures trial. He's strengthened through that trial Yes, it's painful, but his faith and confidence in God doesn't shrink back. It goes forward. That person who perseveres under trial, perseveres with his faith under trial, that person is blessed by God. Looking forward again, let's go to chapter 5, verse 11 in James. I just want to show you this as a little example he, he brings later. We talked about this earlier, but James 5, 11. We count those blessed who endured you have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. So why do we have all these people in the Bible, person after person, male, female, during this generation, that generation, and they're, they're dealing with difficult circumstances, and the difficult circumstances that David had are different than Ruth, and Ruth is different than Esther, and Esther is different from Daniel, Daniel's different from Moses, but in all the variety of these people that are in Scripture, and we read about their trials, then we read about their endurance in the trial, not quitting in their faith, and then we read about their blessing that followed, because God is always faithful to his own. Pretty simple point, isn't it? God's going to bring you tough stuff. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how strong a believer you are. You're going to have hard stuff, and God brings it to you on purpose. You need to endure under it, because if you do, God will take note, approve of what happened, and bless your life. It's pretty simple. It's written over and over and over again to get our attention so we would understand, oh, <laughs> that's what he's doing in my life too. Oh, I get it. Mm -hmm. The Bible speaks to our situation today. That's what we have to believe. And that's what we have to do. Kurt Richardson, in his commentary, says, God wishes to use trials to produce believers who stand their ground through a devout life shaped by the word of God. The testing is finished when the present life is over. God blesses the man who perseveres all the way through life. That verb persevere, hupomeno, means he stays under. There's the trial, he remains under the trial, under the hand of God as he brings the pressure to bear upon his life. He doesn't run away. He doesn't leave, he stays put. He keeps trusting God in the pain, in the sorrow, in the hardship. He never stops believing. He struggles with believing, of course, 
but he never stops. He never throws away his faith. He never abandons faith in Jesus. He never is like those disciples that walked away from Christ because he started saying things that were too hard. Interesting that John in his writing speaks of uh, perseverance, but he usually uses a different term. It's the term abiding. Abide in Christ, we say. What does that mean? Stay, remain, don't leave. It's the verb meno, endure. Meno is used in 1 Peter 1, 23 and 25 to show that God's word endures or remains forever. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it shows that love will endure all the way into eternity. It's forever, it's that word. So John is referring, using that term to refer to believers who remain in the truth. They've heard the gospel, they've heard the truth about Jesus, they remain in God's love, Hard things happen to them. They don't doubt God's love. They understand Christ went to the cross for them. I can't look at my life just externally and see bad and hard things happening and say, ah, God doesn't love me. I gotta look back up at the cross. I gotta remember who suffered for me and I believe that and I stay put and I don't walk away. That's perseverance. If I do that, I'm a true believer. If I do that, I'm in the true church, you see? So this idea of endurance here in verse 12 looks at your life, looks at the believer's life, any believer's life, as an overall kind of judgment. Not just at that little point in January of 2015 or when you really messed up back there in 2009, remember that? And so because of that, that's there. He doesn't look, he doesn't judge your life based upon that mess up in that year or that mess up in that month or then. He's looking at the whole thing and he's judging your life and your faith and your endurance over that. Obviously, the believer does stumble and fall. But a true believer, after he falls, does what? He gets back up. Because he knows there's only one place to turn, Christ. Christ holds his future in his hand. You're either gonna have Jesus Christ as your judge for all of eternity or your savior and your friend for all of eternity. You'll never be able to push Jesus Christ away from your life. It will never happen. You'll choose one of those two paths. He will either condemn you or he will save you. That's the choice. He can either be your master and Lord and savior or he can be your judge and he can be the one that sends you away into the eternal fire. You can always confess a sin directly to God. You can always pick yourself back up. You can always return to God. If you're a true believer, you will never stumble so badly so as to fall and not be able to get back up. God will make sure that of you. He will give you strength. So endurance looks at your life from beginning to end. After each failure, the believer refuses to give up. After each confusing phase of life, when he can't figure out what God is doing, his prayers are not properly answered, in his humble opinion, he still gets back on his knees and says, I don't know what you're doing, but I have no other source of wisdom. When you come to God and say, help me, God, God will listen to that prayer. Hebert again writes, each new test the believer successfully endures adds fresh proof of fidelity to God and contributes to his approved character. In other words, as we're faithful and endure the trial, God adds to us a greater and greater certainty that we really are the children of God, that we're really saved. If we are disobeying and disobeying, that doesn't mean we're not saved, but sometimes we lack the assurance because we're setting up a pattern of disappointing God and being stubborn and being proud and being lustful and, and being fearful and all those things and we're not listening to God and that can hurt our certainty and confidence that we are even saved. But as we endure a trial and another trial, it adds to that confidence, God is at work in my life. Calvin says the faithful are harassed by so many evils for this purpose that their piety and obedience may be made manifest and that they may be at length prepared to receive the crown of life. You're being prepared to receive the crown of life right now. Did you know that? You're on your way to get the crown of life. And that's what all this is about, is preparation. Hmm. It is that overall endurance of faith through a trial-filled life that results in great blessing. Notice the middle part of verse 12 says, for once he has been approved. Once he has been approved. That shows that the blessing, the crown, only comes after the testing. Testing first, crown second. He has to have an approval. Test, approval, crown. We learned that in kindergarten, right? Finish the lesson, 
teacher happy, star on the page. <laughs> How come that guy got two, three stars and I only got one? We know about this. Wait a minute, that sounds like this is salvation by works. No, it's not. No, it's not. All of this is under the banner of grace. None of us get saved by good works. Ephesians 2 says we're saved by grace alone through faith alone, right? Galatians 2, same thing. The true gospel is only that we're saved by faith apart from any works that we do. We do not add to our account in any way. It is all Christ's righteousness that saves us. But when he saves us and he adds grace to us, even Ephesians 2 says we are created new in Christ Jesus for good works. And those good works, amazingly, God chooses to bless and reward. It's amazing. He's rewarding the grace he put in our heart to produce works. Wow. It should just be good enough to have not been punished. Why would we be rewarded for anything? We don't deserve that, but that's what he likes to do. He's a very generous father, and he loves to give gifts and rewards. And he loves to give approval, but this is how you gain approval. There's no approval for half-tested believers. God, time out. I'm done with this. I'd like the next 20 years just be a peaceful, easy thing. And then you can pick up maybe a year before I'm about to die, and then we'll do it that way. <laughs> Approved is the, is the Greek term dokimos. You may remember in verse three it taught that the trials were the testing of your faith. So to be approved by God, that means your faith inside of you, your claim to believe in Jesus Christ has to be tested. And then if it's tested and it endures, then it's found to be genuine, right? This term was used in the testing of metals, particularly coins. You put a coin through a test to make sure it's the real thing. This guy gave me some coins. Is that a real coin or is that a fake? You put it through the test. It passes the test. You're like, hey, this is valuable. That's what God does with our faith. Someone's claiming to have faith. Let's test it. Let's see what happens. You test it. You find that it's true. Why? Because it endured. It endured. Same term, by the way, is used in 2 Timothy 2.15, you will want a people out there. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed handling ac accurately the word of truth. 2 Corinthians 10.18 also uses the same term. It is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he whom the Lord commends. Testing is what this entire life is all about. What is this life about? Testing. What's going on in my Christian life? testing this life is merely a preparation for the next say really all this long time and everything that happens here is just a testing for the next uh huh it's only 70, 80, 90 years then the next life is what thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of years of course this is just, this is just a drop this is just a test to see if you have faith, and if you do, he'll bless you forever and ever and ever. When we get to that side, it'll be like, oh, oh, I see now. Paul was right. The sufferings of this present day were not worthy to be compared to the glory that we are receiving now. But it takes faith to latch onto that now, doesn't it? Relief from your testing comes at the end of your life. So don't listen to those preachers that say any differently. Then you enter into glory. Then you rest from your labors. Then you participate in paradise. You enter the greater blessing. Notice next, this is the second, I've got to hurry here. What way does God bless this man who is blessed? The man who's approved and perseveres in his faith through the trial a trial, notice by the way, it was trial, not trials, one trial, a whole life, a trial-filled life. What will we be blessed with? What way will God bless us? What's the blessing? And the answer is, the reward is, he will receive, and here's where you're supposed to get excited, the crown of life. The crown of life. There it is. That's what God gives. Uh, he gives the crown of life. That's his prize. That's his reward. So the Super Bowl is next week. And I'm sure since the hot days of August when they were in practices or even July, a lot of teammates would look at each other like, wait till we 
lift up that Lombardi trophy in February? What's the prize that they sweat for and get injured for and work hard for? You say, it's the money. <laughs> for some of them, it's the money. For the genuine football player, it's lifting up the Lombardi trophy, the Super Bowl trophy, to be the world champions. No, it's not the Redskins. <laughs> Don't laugh, it's not the Ravens either. But one of those two teams supposedly is going to lift that up. Friends, our prize is greater. It's a greater prize than a Lombardi trophy. It's greater. But you have to wait through this life to get it. It's future. It says so right here. This blessing is so great, I just want to take a little bit of time to explain what this crown of life is and is not. Just track with me for a couple minutes, okay? First, I want you to notice that the crown is one crown, not many. It has an article with it. It does not say, you know, the many crowns of life. It is the crown of life. We only get one. We have a life full of trial, a trial-filled life, and then we get the crown. Blessed is the man who perseveres under this, not a series of trials, but all of life, which is a trial. Once we've completed that and we have persevered in our faith, then we get the crown. Second, I want you to notice the crown that is pictured, as James writes this, is probably the victor's crown in an athletic contest. That was the New Testament's predominant use. Paul uses it this way, for example, in 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, where he says, and this is at the end of his life, I have fought the good fight. Remember that passage? I have finished the course. I have what? Kept the faith. Perseverance. I have kept the faith. I didn't abandon it, right? In the future, in the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. See, he gets awarded will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved Christ's appearing. Another way of talking about a believer, someone who loves Christ and loves the fact that he has appeared. Everybody in that category gets this crown also, promised. Paul finished the race, he won the fight, he kept the faith, he endured all the way to the end of his life. He said he's going to be awarded the victor's crown as in an athletic contest. Of course, James... And the Jews were well aware of these Greek athletic contests all over the Roman world. They were even played in Jerusalem in those days. And by the way, the Jews hated that. But because of the influence of Herod the Great, his budding up with the Romans, they had that there. And the Jews felt it was an encroachment of Greek culture into their, their life. And so they didn't like it at all. That's why some think that James wouldn't be referring to that here. Maybe he's referring to the crown that royalty would have. Psalm 21.3 speaks of a crown that's of fine gold and it's put on the head of a king. Maybe James is referring to that as well. They debate whether they're talking about the victor in an athletic contest or one who's going to get to reign along with Jesus Christ because we will rule with him. I don't really care whether it is that or that. Maybe it's both. I'm going to get a crown from Jesus. The last thing I want you to understand about that crown is that the phrase the crown of life means the crown which is life. Life is the crown on the head. It's an appositional relationship. That's what the other crowns are too. Crown of righteousness means he's going to get, he's going to be crowned with righteousness. Crowned, crown of glory means glory is what he'll be crowned with. He's going to get life, righteousness, and glory. And that's a crown for our heads. He's blessed that way with eternal blessing. I know that some interpret this crown as some kind of a greater reward that will be given only to some faithful believers, not given to other Christians because they weren't faithful enough. Like uh, something like that would be given out of the Bema seat of judgment in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where believers are evaluated for how they live before the Lord Jesus Christ and he gives them rewards based upon their service. But nowhere in scripture do we read of some believers getting more life than other believers. We're crowned with life. That means eternal life, and that is true for all believers. There's no such thing as some getting a little bit of eternal life and others getting more of it. And here, in the context of James, it really doesn't support this idea either uh, that it would be given only to some Christians. Verse 12 specifically states that these are crowns to be given to those who love Christ, who love God, you see. Those who love God is a description that fits all believers. 
Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 equates those who are called to salvation, that is those who are saved, as also those who love God. Listen to the words again. We know that God causes all things to work together for good, and here we have the same group, to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. That's the calling of salvation. That's every believer. That means every believer loves God. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, it says, if anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. You know what accursed means? It means eternally damned. Now, we never love God with all of our heart and all of our soul and our mind as we are exhorted to. We never love him that way, or we'd be perfect, but we do love him. In John's first letter, it says that though we were not the first to love God, we did learn love of God by him first loving us, and then we loved him back. Every believer loves God to some extent. By the way, the same is true in the Old Testament. Believers were regularly talked about as those, definitionally, as those who love God. It's even in the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and verse 6, Psalm 97, 10, Psalm 145, 20, and many other places. Scripture equates the saved people as those who love God. Besides, if it were true that only some believers would get this crown of life, that would mean that some believers are not approved. For James says that everyone who endures is approved and everyone who is approved gets the crown of life. But what is it that is being approved through the trials? The answer has already been given in the text, our faith. Remember verse three equated the testing with the testing of our faith. First Peter one also talks about our faith that is tested as through fire. Faith is the very requirement for salvation and that's what's being tested whether it's real or not. We are saved by faith. Faith is that important. For faith to save, it has to be genuine, so it has to be tested. See? And so all Christians will get this crown of life. That's exciting. This is not just for the super elite. This is not just for the apostles and pastors and martyrs and things like that. This is a promise for all of you who believe. James is teaching really the same thing that Jesus says in the book of Revelation, Revelation 2.10, where he tells the church, be faithful that is faithful to me. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you what? The crown of life. That's the only other place in all of the scripture that uses that exact phrase, the crown of life, and he means the same thing. If you are faithful to me to the end, I will give you and crown you with everlasting life. All true believers endure in their faith to the end, and they are faithful to Christ through a life of trials, even all the way to death. And therefore, for every believer, there is this future reward, the blessed crown of everlasting life. This is the time to whoop it up when you start thinking about that. This is what your heart gets warmed by. This is what energizes your faith. This is what causes you to rejoice when the going gets tough. It's not that the tough get going. It's that they reflect on the truth of God. A promise has been given to me, and I'm going to get that in the future. Some people say, look, I already have life. No, you have a body that's fading away. We already told that in verse 11. There's new life, it's better life, it's resurrection life, it's permanent life, your body's better, everybody around you's gonna be better, life is better, environment's better, your heart is better, your mind is better, better leadership, everything's better. There is a sense, obviously, in which we have everlasting life now. We know in John's gospel, he talks about that over and over. He's, uh, in fact, in John 5, 24, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in God who sent me already has eternal life. That's how you get eternal life. If you're wondering, how do I get eternal life? The answer is listen to God in the Bible and believe in Jesus Christ whom God sent and you are given everlasting life. There it is. It's that simple. You don't work for it. You don't earn it. So there's a sense in which it's my possession now. I'm not looking forward to it. I already have it. But there's a greater sense. The life that is coming is the fuller expression of the life that you already have. It's not a different kind of life. It's just the full-blown thing. It's everything that your life is now that you already enjoy in Christ. It's just going to be magnified and you're going to see it with all of its blessing and all of its glory and all of its joy. That's what it is. But you have to endure. And so Jesus said, you will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. Matthew 10, 22. We have to hold fast the confession of our faith and our hope in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 2 says the same. By the gospel of Jesus, he told the Corinthians, you are saved if you hold fast the word which I preach to you unless you believed in vain. What does it mean to believe in vain, to begin to believe and then to let go and no longer believe? 
James is looking at the future life as the eternal resurrection life, the permanent life, where the spiritual life that we have now in Christ is fully and completely realized. The crown is the final bestowal or complete bestowal of life, pointing to that eternal bliss that we will have. To be crowned with life then, you have to endure trial now. And the Lord promised it to us. 1 John 2.25, this is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life, eternal life. Nobody can promise you eternal life, keep it. Nothing that you'll ever be promised in life will be better than eternal life. Eternal life, it's better than face cream. Eternal life, it's better than good insurance. Everlasting, blissful, glorious life with God. Everything that you wish life to be will be that and it will never end and no one can steal it from you and you can't mess it up. Because if we could mess it up, we would and it wouldn't be much of a promise. It'd be like Adam and Eve all over again. We're gonna be better off than Adam and Eve. Paradise, you can't mess up. No devil coming in there and saying, um, did God really say? None of that. Beloved, there's nothing more important than eternal life. Seek God's reward. It's a better reward. Seek it. By the way, there's nothing wrong with seeking reward from God. If your only motive is I want to get rich, obviously that's, that's not really seeking reward from God. If you're willing to do the will of God and have pain and sorrow on earth because you want to be pleasing to your heavenly Father, and when you, you're all alone, sitting on your bed, alone in your closet, whatever your little nice spot is, you know? And you're all alone there. For me, it's usually outside under the stars or something. And you're thinking, what am I doing? What's motivating me? Why am I doing what I'm doing? It should settle back to this. I want to please Jesus Christ with my life. I want him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want to be pleasing to him. And yes, I would gloriously and humbly receive everlasting life crowned on my head knowing I don't deserve it at all but taking it and saying thank you, right? Uh, This is the core motivation to love God, to seek reward from God. Though none go with me, still I will what? Follow. Why? Because this is what I want. This is what I want more than anything else. Now you might be sitting there thinking, you know, I don't know that I'm saved. And I'm gonna be down front and I want you to come talk to me after the service. And we're gonna talk about that. Talk about how you can be sure you're saved. Come, don't be afraid, come and talk. I'm not that intimidating when I'm down there. I'm short, you come talk to me. (laughs) Or come talk to some of the other leaders. Make sure in your heart you know you've given up your life. What did Jesus say? You know, if you hang on to your life in this life, you're gonna lose it anyway. But if you would lose your life for my sake, you're gonna find it. You're gonna find it. Father, we pray that you would work on our heart's motivation and let us be in all that we do, singing, parenting, loving the brethren, preaching the gospel, witnessing to others, even the job that we go to, punch the clock every day, we'd be pleasing to you. Thank you, Father God, for helping sustain our faith that we would be able to abide and persevere to the end because of your gracious help. We know it's not all on us. And Father, we're grateful for the new uh, members that you're bringing to our church. Pray a blessing on this time of our service now as we receive them. In Christ's name, amen.